In this video, I'm going to introduce the three basic modes of heat transfer that we're going to study in this course. I'm going to talk a little bit about the mechanisms for each of those heat transfer modes to try and give an appreciation and understanding of what these are. In subsequent videos, we'll look more in detail at the mathematics and being able to do calculations with them, but for now, I'd like you to get an appreciation of what's going on in these different modes of heat transfer. So the first mode of heat transfer we're going to talk about is conduction. Conduction is that mode of heat transfer that is where energy is transported because of the molecular motions of the material through which the energy is being transported. We could have a solid or a liquid through which or a gas through which energy is being transported, but in all of these cases, the molecules that make up these materials are interacting with one another, such that if I put a high temperature here, perhaps I apply a flame to this end of my spoon, I will provide more energy to the molecules here, which are connected, of course, to all of the other molecules. They will start vibrating more, translating more, moving around more, and pass on some energy to the molecules adjacent to them, which subsequently will pass that energy along down that spoon. Conduction heat transfer is governed by Fourier's law of conduction, which tells you that the heat transfer, the rate of heat transfer in watts, the movement of energy per unit time, joules per second, watts, um, which would be our heat rate, is equal to a material constant called the conductivity times the area through which the energy is being transported times the temperature gradient. The constant is called the thermal conductivity, and different materials have different thermal conductivities. We probably know from experience that if we put our spoon in a hot cup of tea and that spoon is made of metal, we'll very quickly feel the effect of that hot tea being conducted through the spoon as the molecules interact with one another and eventually pass through and start interacting with the molecules in my hand. If I instead use a wooden spoon, put that in my hot tea, it's going to take a lot longer time for, for me to feel the warmth and I'm not going to feel anywhere near the same high temperatures that I would feel in the case of the metal spoon. That's because the thermal conductivity is much lower in this spoon and ultimately much less energy is being transported from the tea towards my hand. Now if we think about a gas, perhaps the air in this room, if we have a region over here that is much that is significantly heated. Perhaps, again, we had a candle burning over here and we've generated some heat in this air. Now these air molecules are moving around much more quickly over here, and as they collide with their adjacent air molecules, they impart some of that energy to those air molecules, which subsequently um, impart energy to the, to, to the adjacent air molecules, and energy is transported the through the room through all of these interactions. We can imagine through that that at a higher temperature, these molecules are moving around more quickly, that there's going to be a better energy transport because they're moving around more quickly and having more interactions. And so the thermal conductivity of a heated gas should be higher than the thermal conductivity of a cool gas. We'll talk in more detail about this in module two. When it comes to conduction, of course, the thermal conductivity multiplies the area and the temperature gradient, and there's a negative sign because the energy is transported from regions of high temperature to low temperature, so it moves against the temperature gradient. One of the ways to enhance heat transfer is to extend the area of our part. So this is a heat sink that I pulled from the graphics card in an old computer, and you can see that there's a fin array here. This would be placed on the chip in the computer on the graphics card, and what this is effectively doing is putting a high conductivity material on that surface and extending its surface area in order to maximize the heat transfer from that surface. In heat transfer, we are interested in the rates of heat transfer. And so our traditionally our con conservation of energy equation that's written as the change of energy being equal to the work being done on the system plus any energy transported into the system as heat. We're going to divide each of these terms by the time it takes for this transport to occur, and hence everything is going to be a rate. We look at the rate of change of energy in the system and the rate of transport of energy through the boundaries of the system, as well as the rate of energy generation. The next mode of heat transfer I want to consider is called convection. Convection includes all that which is conduction, but it also includes the bulk motion of a fluid. Usually when we're talking about convection, we're talking about the energy transport from a surface to the adjacent fluid. And of course, the, the, the fluid that is moving and picking up or delivering energy has molecules which are moving around and interacting, and so conduction is happening in there, but it's overwhelmed by the fact that this fluid is in motion. So 
if I had my heated air over here and I put a fan on behind it and I blew this air over here, the fact that this molecule has a higher energy has now been moved by that bulk motion over here has resulted in an enhanced heat transfer from this position to this position. So convection heat transfer involves the bulk motion of a fluid in picking up and carrying the energy of those molecules over to another area. And of course we can expect to have higher rates of heat transport because we're physically moving that with a bulk fluid motion. Convection heat transfer is governed by Newton's law of cooling, where the rate of heat transfer in watts is equal to a convection coefficient times the area of the surface through which the energy is being transferred times the difference in temperature between a surface and the moving fluid. There are two different types of convection heat transfer, natural convection and forced convection. In the case of natural convection, the motion of the fluid is arising because of the energy transport itself. In most fluids, the density decreases as the temperature is increased. So as we transport energy to the air, it becomes less dense than the air around it and it becomes buoyant and hence it starts to rise through the adjacent cooler air. And that's our free convection. Um, and this fin array that I showed you already, which came from a graphics card, you may see something like this on the back of a power amplifier or other uh, electronics that you might see. And generally, there's no fan involved in something that looks like this. Generally, we're relying on the fact that energy transport from that heated surface is going to heat the air. It's going to result in buoyancy forces. The fluid's going to rise, and we're going to get convective heat transport. When we can't rely on free convection, we have forced convection. This is a fin array, or a heat sink, that I've taken off a, a central processing unit in a computer, a CPU. And you can see right on the end of this fin array, a fan has been installed. By inf installing this fan in here and putting power into that fan, we're forcing fluid through this fin array. Through this fin array. And of course the CPU would have been here, which means that the fluid is going to come through this fin array, it's going to impinge on that surface and come out the sides of this. Because we're forcing that fluid, we have a control over the velocity, we can increase the speed of this fan, we can increase the velocity, and we expect higher heat transfer rates or higher convection coefficients in our Newton's Law of Cooling when we have forced convection. The final form of heat transfer is fundamentally different than conduction and convection. Radiation is an incredibly important topic, and of course it explains things like why the sky is blue, why you might see frost on the ground even though the air temperature is above zero, and why you may not see frost on the ground if it's the same temperature but it happens to be a cloudy night instead of a clear night. Radiation is that energy transport by phonons or by the changes of energy states of the electrons in the matter that makes up the materials. If the electrons are in a higher energy state and they drop down to a lower energy state, that difference in energy is given off in the terms in the form of electromagnetic radiation. It's very special compared to the other modes in that it is a function of wavelength. It's also more complicated than the other forms of heat transfer because radiation is emitted in different wavelengths, and that can be important for how the radiation energy interacts with surfaces. A surface will emit radiation as long as it has any temperature above absolute zero according to the Stefan Boltzmann law, and that involves the temperature raised to the fourth power. Because it's raised to the fourth power and because we're talking about thermodynamics, you must use temperatures in Kelvin. Now, in addition to the radiation that's emitted by a surface, radiation is of course incident upon that surface from the surroundings, from the sun, from the ambient radiation in the room. And that radiation which is incident upon the surface may be absorbed, it may be reflected, it may be transmitted through that surface. And so we have to understand the interactions with the various surfaces. In the simplest sense, for an opaque surface, which is emitting radiation based on its temperature and absorbing radiation uh, sorry, and having radiation incident upon it, um, we can look at the net energy transfer to or from the surface, the difference between that which is being emitted and that which is being absorbed. And that's given by this equation here. And for a highly idealized surface called a gray surface, which is very useful for many engineering calculations, we can use this calculation to this equation here to determine the net rate of heat transfer to it from that surface. In the next video, I'll go into a little bit more detail with each of these equations and discuss these modes of heat transfer a little more mathematically.